glad to see everyone this morning. We want to say welcome to the house of God and welcome to our morning devotional service. I'm sure we do appreciate God's presence one more time in our midst and we do thoroughly appreciate the uh, opening by the orchestra and the choir. The orchestra got us to a very good start by playing lead on, lead on, and we just had that beautiful rendition from the choir, our God and my, our great and mighty God. We're going to join our voices together in worship as we sing, and we're going to start from S S number 229, Great is the Lord who ruleth over all. We'll sing verses 1, 3, and 4, and some more songs as we worship to God together, and Sister Comfort will lead us in the singing. SSNS number 857. 857. I know not why God's wondrous love. We are going to sing verse, all the, the three verses. Three verses, one to three. <laughs> Oh, 
next song would be SS&S 540. SS&S 540. O oh, wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord, a wonderful Savior to me. He hided my soul in the cleft of the rock where rivers of pleasure I see. We are going to sing verses 1, 3, and 4 of this song after the introduction by the orchestra. Seven, seven, we are taking verses one, three, and four. One, three, and four. Thank you. 
help us to stand on his promises for he is faithful a song before prayer would be ancient words ancient words we shall stand up to sing for those of us who can stand to sing all the verses of ancient words and afterwards we shall remain standing to be led in congregational prayer
heaven father we thank you we give you all the glory we honor you thank you for this wonderful day what a wonderful morning Lord, we feel your presence. We feel your presence. Lord, thank you that you are among us. Guide us. Lead us. Make us what you want us to be. We give you all the glory and honor. Lord, we thank you for this privilege to be in this sanctuary. There are so many of people who are not here, but you have given us this privilege. Lord, help us to make use of it. As thy word shall come, your ancient word. Lord, we open our hearts. Help us to receive it. Amen. Let it impart our hearts, Lord. Amen. We put your servant as he shall deliver your word. Amen. Lord, anoint him. Amen. Speak through him, Lord. Amen. And let your word penetrate our hearts Amen. and transform our lives. Amen. Save today. Amen sanctify. Amen. Baptize with the Holy Ghost and fire. Amen. Heal the sick. Amen. Give us a great revival. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray.
to um, add to the announcement that the coach um, that will be provided here should be leaving here at 7 o'clock, so please, the ladies should uh, get that on. We are reading from Matthew chapter 5, from verse 38 to 48. Verse 38, ye have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at the law, and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. 42, give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the public and so for dead and the last. Be therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Walking through the fairy trails, 
of war the sudden faces drooling to wrap his smiles then I bow my head and whispered Lord please do this sin for me and I'm proud that I can tell you that is given victory I sin because there's an empty grace I sing because there's a part to save I sing because his grace is real to me. Oh, I sing because I know I'm not alone. I sing because someday I'm going on where I shall sing through all eternity. I sing because there's an empty grave. I sing because there's a part to save. I sing because His grace really to me. I sing because I know I'm not alone. I sing because someday I'm going nowhere. I shall sing through all eternity. Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, we read um, the last verse there, verse 48. It says, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Well, I guess if you look at the the tone of that last verse. This is the last, is a section of the Sermon on the Mount, the Sermon that was given on the Mount. We, we know at some point he punctuated and said, be ye therefore perfect. Be, the word be, B-E, is an action word. It's almost like a command. It's a requirement. He was giving his disciples there. He says, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. But I guess when we begin to unfold the previous verses, we kind of understand the context in which he was actually describing this and we'll be able to understand what um, you know, Christ meant by being perfect there. But um, when we look at that word perfect, maybe just in a literary sense, per to be perfect means to make something completely free from faults or defects. That's the dictionary meaning, by the way make as good as possible, having all the required or desirable elements or qualities or characteristics, something that is absolute, something that is complete. Um, I, I guess I, I work in the IT industry and one of the things that people talk about when you're designing applications or even, maybe not even IT now, um, but when you design applications to provide a service or to a process that's got to do something. We have what's called the repair service where people are going to do repairs in homes and they want to design the process in such a way that they want it to be right first time. You want to go in there, do your repair, get it done and no defects. Something just right first time. That's something organizations aim to do. And when you get that, you might say that service is perfect. Oftentimes, you don't achieve that. I mean, for example, we had a, as good as the toilet refurbishment was, we all love it, whatever. But one thing we discovered at the end of the whole exercise, there were a few things that were not kind of perfect in the sense that the men's toilet, for example, we had to be, it had to be out of use for several weeks. And they had to be what they call snagging. They, all this, there was a lot of snagging to take place. But if they got everything right first time, you might as well call that um, near to perfection. So we, we, we know this term perfection as they tell, they usually call some people perfectionist. If you're a perfectionist, you're someone who refuses to accept any standard short of perfection. Of course, it might be something we are aiming at which may not be possible, but this is something that in the world today, 
you perfection to be perfect is something people are trying to aim at to just really be complete. And some experts, they, sometimes when they advise, they might say, okay, if you want to aim for perfection, ensure they are not being distracted, stay motivated, you know, don't leave anything halfway, determination and perseverance. Be the By the time you begin to combine these things, it might lead you to perfection. Um, but we want to see how God values his children to become perfect. And what does it mean by being perfect? It's very important. If the Bible says so, then it's important. And actually, when we go into the Bible, in 2 Chronicles 16, 9, the first part of that says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in behalf of them whose heart is perfect towards him. So that means the Lord places a premium on being perfect. It means somehow... There's a premium on that. It's that God wants to show himself strong on our behalf. And that's why if God says, be there perfect, God will help us to be so. And, and, and even the, the, the same Bible in Genesis 6, 9 says, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. Which means Noah fulfilled that requirement no wonder his family was just among that first, the eight people that were saved in the first world, if we like. And that means perfect is something that um, God actually holds in high regard. No wonder the Bible says, mark the perfect man and behold the upright, for the end of that man is peace. So it's not a word we can ignore. It's not something we can undermine. It's not something we can pass by. I think it would be better for us to try and understand what really is Christ saying here? Why did he use this? And what is the reason for actually requiring his children to be perfect? Or in, in essence, to be, to be that complete product. To be that finished product that God designs us to be. To be, when we say we are holy, that holiness has a tone of perfection to it. That's the reason why oftentimes people talk about Christian perfection, and we really want to be that. And I'm sure God is going to give us the grace to be so. In Psalm 19:7, it says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. We can see even the law that um, the Jewish, the Jews related to, the Bible says that law is perfect. That if <coughs> The Bible says somewhere that the law is spiritual. Paul said that. He said the law is spiritual, but he said he was carnal, sold under sin. So the law in itself by design is perfect. But the problem was the weakness of the flesh. And that's the reason why there was something not quite right in the, in the Old Testament dispensation in terms of how people disposed themselves to what actually God exposed to them, the light that God exposed them at that time. And that was the law, if you like. That law was perfect, but that same law, the Bible says um, about that law in Hebrews 7, 19. For the law made nothing perfect. Can you imagine that? We need to understand scriptures. To re re he said, the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did by the which we draw nigh unto God. That means the law of God that was designed to be perfect for some reason, it made nothing perfect. And the reason why it made nothing perfect was because of the weakness of the flesh, because of that weakness, because of that Adamic nature that was very prevalent among the people, they were unable to actually fulfill the law of God. And God had to bring in a better, a better law, a better hope, something that was laid on better promises that will enable not just the Jews only, but also the Gentile world to be able to attain unto the perfection that God intended humans to attain to from the very beginning. And that's why we are so grateful that we are actually very opportune to have that. In the same Bible says, wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions. That means the law when he says, thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not do that, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery, you know, yet a lot of them couldn't. They say guilty in one, guilty in all. The Bible actually said they couldn't, um, the Jews predominantly couldn't fulfill that law. But the law needed to be there because when people 
fall foul of the law, how would you bring them to, you know, you know it was added because of transgression. People would actually transgress it. And when they say, you've seen it, thou shalt not commit adultery. You've done it now. And the, the law says that such people should be killed. That's in the Old Testament dispensation. But if the law wasn't there, it wouldn't have been possible to enact punishment. It's similar to the laws in society today. Without the laws we have in society today, it would be chaotic, wouldn't it? be completely chaotic. So the law in the Jewish religion was added because of transgressions. So um, in, in Romans 8, it says, for, that, for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemns sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So the design of God was to make us walk not in the flesh, but in the spirit. To walk after the spirit. And when we walk after the spirit, it becomes possible to attain the righteousness of the law. Does that make sense? So, and that's what's going to enable us to be able to attain that perfection which um, God was aiming at. In, in the text we're reading from Matthew 17, if you've got time, Matthew chapter 5, 17 through to 48. If you read that whole discourse, you kind of get the whole package before it ended with that verse 48 and, and demanding us to be perfect. In verse 17 there it says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy but to fulfill. Imagine, you, you can see sometimes you, you need to be really get your head into the Bible to understand the dynamics of all these conversations. He didn't come to destroy the law because there was something God was expecting in the law, but he came to really translate it in a way to understand the mind of God why he put that law there and enable us to be able to kind of accomplish it. So to fulfill the law means to accomplish it, to be able to, that which the weakness of the flesh couldn't do, to give us the enabling to be able to fulfill, to complete, to be that, to be that complete person that God in, designs us to be. And, and we all know that part of the law was a ceremonial side, isn't it? So where there were rituals and ceremonies, lots and lots of killings of animals, of, you know, a bit... Um, sheep and beat and bullocks, all the kind of different killings. The whole idea of that is to be able to atone for sins. But then, in spite of all that atonement that was done, yet sin still was prevalent. And that's why Jesus Christ, who came to fulfill all that, they were all types and shadows pointing to Jesus Christ, who perfectly fulfilled the law. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh, became man, lived the life that God was expected and also died for us since it became that perfect sacrifice. When you look at the, the bulls and goats and everything that was used at that time, there was this, they needed to be without blemish, without spot, without wrinkle. They were to prefigure Christ who actually lived the sinless life. He was without blemish, without sin, without spot, you name it. But he perfectly fulfilled that. So in that sense, the law as it was put together in the Old Testament was no longer needed. That's why it kind of passed away. But the righteousness of the law leads us to Christian perfection. When we're able to fulfill the righteousness that God intended to, then we can be. So when he says, be ye therefore perfect, we can say by his grace, he can make us perfect. Amen. And God will um, achieve that for us. Because the, the uh, Christian perfection actually mirrors God's nature. The law was actually almost our own Adamic nature, which was weak, seemed to be what was falling foul to it. But God now presented his own very nature to enable us to fulfill the law. No, no, no wonder the Bible says, you know, God in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1, he says God at sundry times spoke to, you know, um, spoke to... And I spoke to our fathers in times past um, who, you know, spoke to them in diverse ways, in diverse um, manners um, by the prophets. But then in these last days, um, in verse 3 said, um, in verse 2 says, Hath he in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he had appointed here of all things, by whom also he made the world, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. Very important. Jesus Christ was the express image God is far off there. We can't, because God is spirit, is up there. Sometimes it may be difficult to understand how God is. 
So he decided to come in human flesh, live as a human, and by the way he lived and conducted himself, that was the example that we're to pattern our lives. That's why the Bible says that Jesus Christ was the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins and um, sat down at the right hand of the God on high. So we, we can see um, what we're trying to say here, what the Bible is trying to say is Jesus Christ came for a purpose to enable us to be able to be what God exactly wants us to be. Because Matthew 5, that sermon on the mount, he actually began to, you know, the, the law, they said it was added because of transgressions. There was some, a kind of um, period whereby God dealt with people in a certain way based on our weaknesses, began to, then when Jesus Christ came, he went back to the very beginning. Very, very beginning, what God intended to, and began to unpack his will. Began to unpack his, his will, his desire for us, what he intended us to be able to do. And that was what Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 through to 48 was effectively trying to unravel there. He was revealing the death of righteousness of God, that the righteousness that God requires in the human heart. What he really required in the human heart, he was actually revealing, to, revealing it to us. And he was effectively saying that the only way we can achieve that is to come through Christ. If we don't come through Christ and be born again and really have our nature completely changed, it will be impossible to be able to live that kind of life. But the other side of it is when we are genuinely born again, when we actually have Christ, we will, he will give us Christ's very nature. That express image, he'll be able to enable us to be able to live that kind of life. That's why sometimes we wonder, why didn't that sermon on the mount, why wasn't it preached long before Christ came? We were not prepared for it then. People were not, didn't have the disposition to be able to absorb it. But now with Christ in the picture, he felt, this is the real deal. This is actually the very intention for why Christ came into the world. If we, um, he, and, and what he's trying to say is, he was literally saying that we can't live by the standard of the letter of the law. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. You know, that's the letter. That's the letter, but there's something beyond what is written down. There is something, there's a spirit behind why that was written there. And it was delving into the very spirit behind those writings. But if we just look at letter, I've got the Ten Commandments, I'm doing all I can to, you know, honor my father, my mother, do that. That's the letter. But it was delving a bit deeper and saying the spirit behind it, unless we possess that spirit, that same spirit, that he used to actually enact these things, it may not be possible to be able to please God. But I'm sure God will help us. That's the reason why when he says, be therefore perfect, very easily as human beings, no one is perfect. We'll quickly conclude, nobody can be perfect. No, 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 no. But there's a reason. If Christ is demanding, there's a reason. That means he's giving us the enabling to be able to achieve what God is intending in the human heart. In, in Matthew chapter 5, 19 to 20, that's from our text, if you read it there, it says there that uh, whosoever therefore shall break one of the least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. One thing we'll notice is that that same law, the Ten Commandments, so to say, when he began to break it down into management chunks, he's now saying that this, what he's saying now, the things we'll be looking at, that if anyone, whosoever, shall break one of these, when Christ is now expounded on it and we break it, we feel, no, 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 that's not for me, then they said, such a person, and, and, and teach men such so that, no, no, it's not possible to do that. We begin to teach men such. He said, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven, but whosoever shall do and teach them. So may God help us to be able to do and teach them also. To do that which God is, this and said, such will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And verse 20, for I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. And, and sometimes we wonder, what does he mean by the righteousness of the Pharisees and scribes? They were the rulers of those days. They were the teachers of the law. 
The righteousness means that that woman was caught in adultery, wasn't she? The law says, kill her. He said, if that's where it, your, your understanding of the law is, if that's where it actually finishes, then your, if, it, if your righteousness doesn't exceed that, if it doesn't go beyond the understanding, the very spirit behind why God does that, he said that we will in no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. That if our righteousness, we're not even talking about hypocrisy now. We're just purely talking about looking at it from the letter side. Just after all. Some people say, after all, I obey the Ten Commandments. That's the letter. If that's where your righteousness actually hangs on, they said one cannot make the kingdom of heaven. There's a spirit that goes beyond that. And that's why when we begin to now look at some of the verses that just Christ was referring to, in verse 21 of chapter 5, Ye have heard that it was said by them of all time, Thou shalt not kill. That's the letter of the law. The letter of the law says, Thou shalt not kill. But they say now that, um, And whosoever shall kill shall be in the danger of judgment. That means the judgment that you get, if it's maybe killing by, to be stoned or whatever, that when you kill, that is it. That's the letter of the law. But the spirit of the law is in verse 22. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Shall we see this now? The very spirit is the spirit of anger. That being rash without, you know, that kind of um, um, rash anger is something is called heart murder. When you've got rash anger, they, he said someone may call someone in, in the Jewish um, uh, culture, they, they usually use what, terms like raka, you fool. In our different cultures, we have ways when we are, you know, when you're upset, something just comes out, spills out of your mouth. Say, you, you know, someone might say, you idiots. I'm just saying that, you know. Or you just say it. You know, said you can be, in the, you are in the danger of judgment. You don't have to kill. When that comes out of spite, when it comes out of hatred, when it comes out of some kind of animosity, that's the spirit of the law. And he said, whosoever does not teach this, if you don't get into that spirit level and teach it and do such, we say we're in the danger of judgment. That same judgment that someone who commits adultery or commits murder is what we are in danger of. That is the spirit of the law. But we pray God to give us the grace. Because Christ... It, it, being born, that's why he told Nicodemus, who was a teacher, you know, he was, you know, he was, a, he was a, a member of the sun. He came to Jesus Christ by night. He was wondering, what kind of teaching is this? This is different from what I've learned all my. I'm, after all, I'm, I'm a full time, I'm a full time religionist. They, they spent all their life doing that. He came by night, said, "Look, with this my situation, I know I can't make heaven." Then he said, Master, I know no one can do what you're doing except you're from God. Then he told Nicodemus, unless a man is born again. It means he needed the disposition to be able to get to that level. To be able to be able to live such a kind of life. And may God give us that disposition. That's what salvation does for us. Christ told them that, you know, the, 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 the kind of things that I'm just saying, Raka, saying thou fool or whatever. They made light of it. No, no, that is not important. After all, you haven't committed murder. But they said, if you hate your brother, you know, it says in the epistles, isn't it? Anyone who hates his brother or his sister is a murderer. That's what it says. But it's a spirit in us that enables us to love. If, if, if the flesh is weak, it's carnal. He can't. Paul said he tried. The things I wanted to do, he could not do. Because he didn't have what it took to do it. That's why being born again, if we're not born again, we better be born again or we profess to be saved but yet we haven't got victory over sin, that means we're not really born again. Then we should just do it and get it. That's what he was telling him in that. And when, when we move a bit further, um, it, it says there in, um, in, in, verse, um, you know, in verse 23 that we often read, it says, Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest thy brother hath ought against thee. What they say in that kind of spirit now, that kind of spirit whereby I cannot afford the spirit of Christ doesn't hate anyone. He said when you just remember you're bringing your gift, you want to, you're bringing your prayer, your thanksgiving, whatever, saying God I thank you for all that and you remember just a little thing, maybe your husband, your wife, wherever, uh, there's something not quite right there. He said don't even offer that gift. Go and sort it out. That's a spirit. That is about perfection. That's what it means. I be therefore perfect. 
That's what it means about perfection. He wants us to be complete. The law was perfect, but the Israelites were not perfect. And the majority of them were not perfect. He's giving us the enabling now to rise, raise us to that level where we can be perfect. And that's why we want God to really go. In verse 27, it says, Ye have heard that it was said of them of old, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. The Israelites, the letter was, Yes, she's caught in adultery. Kill her. That's the letter. That's what we know in society too. So on, so on. But he's saying it starts from the heart. You begin to lust after someone. You begin to desire, you know, some holy, the unholy attraction towards that person. He said that in itself is adultery. The moment you begin to, de- you haven't committed the act, but it, you wish that it, 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 it's happened. Is that the spirit of the law? He said, such a person has committed. So it goes beyond the outward act. That's why Christianity is not about um, looking and trying to judge each other. No. It's about the Spirit of God working in our hearts. It's about us allowing the Spirit of God to just work fully in our hearts and responding to it. Because a lot of things, no matter how good we may, we may not even know, we may not even understand. Our, our closest companions would not know the deepest recesses of our heart, what's going on there. But the Spirit of God knows. And that's why we just need to open our hearts up to him for him to be able to actually do that. No one that it said they said, if thy right hand, somewhere after that, could it said, if thy right hand offend thee, do you what? Pluck it off. But when in the Jewish culture, when you talk about right foot, right hand, it's the most precious thing. These are the things they use more. But it, it's if you know you need to do something practical to be able to actually fulfill God, just do it. Sometimes some people may actually deny themselves and say, no, I'm not going to go into those kind of environments. Maybe this environment in itself is not wrong, but so that I don't fall into that temptation, it's a no-no for me. Maybe I'm not going to actually even participate in some activities because of this. Your right hand, something that will be painful to you, it's better for that to stay and you make heaven than to let that besetting sin be your undoing and you end up in hell. That's what it's saying. That's what it's saying. It goes as much as that. And then it goes on and on. It talks about um, um, the law regarding oath taking. He said, swear, they, they used to swear. When I swear by, but you know, you, you hear swear to God. There was a lot of swearing. Swearing means that the moment you mention God, it is true. He said, no, no, no. It goes beyond that. You shouldn't swear. It's the heart now. If there's tr- speak truth in your heart. That's all is required of us now. Speak truth in your heart. The moment you want to say, let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. Anything outside that is not this thing. That is the spirit of the law. And then when we kind of move to verse 33, it said, again, ye have heard that it had been said by them of old time, thou shalt not forswear thyself. I think we've talked about that. Or perform any oaths. And when he said in verse 37, let your communication be yea and yea or nay be nay. Verse 38 says, ye have heard that it had been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Definitely, you know, someone who is, is, is killed someone, he should be killed. It's not saying that maybe God is not going to render vengeance. But from the, part, the person's perspective, you, vengeance is God's. You don't retaliate. He was saying the spirit of retaliation goes away completely. And he was t- telling us there that um, in, that, in that verse... Um, um, in, in verse 30, yeah, verse 38, verse 39. But I say unto you that ye resist not evil. Imagine that. But whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to the, him the other also. People might say that, oh, that's not possible. But the Bible is saying if you have the Spirit of Christ, who is the very express image of God, Christianity means we are Christ like. We've got something in us. That enables us to live kind of life. That's why these teachings were unpacked at this time. It was unpacked whereby we say, yes, now that we are of Christ. It is now telling us that, yes, then, you know, smite you on this. That means there's just nothing in there that just retaliates. Nothing there. You'd rather be praying for, this, for the person. But, of course, if you're not born again, you can't do that. If you're not genuinely born again, you can't do that. But that's what he's trying to tell us to do. And that is the perfection God is aiming at. When he said, be ye therefore perfect. Our righteousness needs to exceed. The Pharisees and the the scribes didn't go beyond the letter. But the spirit is what is being unpacked here. 
and we were praying God to give us the grace to be Christians and to be Christ-like. That is what it means to be Christ-like. And then he was telling us that in verse 30, in verse 40, he says, And if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. Imagine that. He's saying, all I want is peace. All you say is peace. If it means I would, I would lose all that, let it go. All I want is peace. That's a Christ-like spirit. A Christian, when it's retaliation, he's done this, I want to do that, that's not the spirit of Christ. That's the spirit of the flesh. That is our weakness of the flesh. That's our Adamic nature. That means our, no wonder, the reason why when we preach or teaching on Christian perfection, they talk about sanctification. They say when we are saved, then when the Adamic nature is rooted out, we're able to get that root of sin out of us, then we will have the grace to be able to do all this. Someone slaps you, there's just nothing that retaliates. That is Christ. There's just nothing there. Nothing. Nothing. In, it's not something you struggle to do. It's not something you make an attempt to do. It's just something that is just intrinsic within you. That's what Christ has put inside us. And that is the perfection he was aiming at. If we kind of move, as we move towards um, the, the end, we may not be able to cover everything. If we look at that um, verse 30, 43, it says there, Ye have heard that uh, had been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. You know, in the Old Testament, the enemies of God, they, were, they had to kill all of them, isn't it? When they got to, to the land of Kenyan, they, had, they killed so many, wasn't it? Hate thy enemy, the enemies of God. But he said, then, that was what he, now, he said, love your enemies. That's the reason why when we read the Old Testament, we need to understand the Old Testament, what it means in its context, and understand the New Testament. We can't take a lot in its face, but we need to understand the context of when it was written and the higher thing that is expected of us in the new dispensation. He said, now love your enemies. Imagine that's when he was ending, he would talk about um, that God. When he said, he said, God, the same God that will give sun. Have you ever seen that when God puts the sunshine there, he would just put it on 95 Fenham Road again and say the rest of the roads are sinners. They won't have any sun. Do you get that? No! No, you don't get that, do you? And he said, that's the nature. That's, that's the, Christ came to give us that kind of life. He said, be like your father. Be like him. We, we don't have that nature. By nature, we are not made to behave that way or act that way. But when we become born again, we are disposed to behave that way. That's why a, a Christian, a, 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 the Christian's life speaks volumes. There are light anywhere they are. Because there are people who you can say, mark the perfect man. There are the people that you can say, yes, in the context, of course, we're, we're not perfect when we look at God. We're not saying that. But we're talking of Christian perfection. Because we are aiming our whole heart and dispositions, aiming towards what the Spirit of Christ can accomplish in our lives. That finished product that God was intended us to actually achieve all the way through. And that is our intention. The standard of those who follow Christ is not simply the law, but the spirit of the law. We need to have that, say, that spirit of the law inside us, which is God himself. That is the perfection that Jesus Christ was calling his disciples to. That was exactly when he said, after finishing that whole discourse in verse 48, he said, be ye therefore perfect. Everything he was saying there was about perfection. Ye have heard of old. So please, that's why anywhere we are, Anywhere we are, all it takes is one saved soul in a home. That home will know a difference. In the, in the, in, you know, we've got the husband, wife, it takes one saved soul. That home will know that there's something different. Because we, we, it's, it's almost having God in the home. Having the very nature of God resided in a home. That is what Christianity is all about. He said if we're not perfect, if our righteousness doesn't exceed the Pharisees and Sadducees, we can't make heaven. We can't. But his grace is sufficient. No, no wonder. I said, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. Of course, that perfection, we go from grace to grace. We go from glory to glory. We may not have the much love that we desire to have today, but as we continue to avail ourselves of the gospel, as we continue to preach the, you know, the wisdom of God who is Christ, as we continue to expose our hearts to it, as we continue to read our Bibles and begin to enjoy the, the very, very wisdom of God there, we, and we then pray, 
He will be transforming us from grace to grace, from glory to glory, from strength to strength, until we achieve, until we attain that um, perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's in Ephesians 4.13. I, I think it's good to have a prayer meeting. Let, let's just go and speak to our God, and he's able to make us perfect. The altar is open as we come to pray. thank you. Thank you for your word. Help us, O oh Lord. Make us perfect. Use your blood to make us perfect. You know where we have failed. We want to pass. Jesus, come and help us so we can be like you. We know you have all the powers to help us. Deep us in your blood. Amen. We know you will do it. Bless us and make us a blessing. Amen. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 